Welcome to this short video on cardiac ultrasound. Let's start right away. Um, so let, first of all, let's talk about some ultrasound tips. First, you have, with anything, your ultrasound, you have a three-dimensional structure, but the ultrasound only takes cross-sections of that. So it's sort of like your anatomy cross-sections. So it's really your job to actually put all those cross-sections together into your mind to get a three-dimensional structure. It's really hard to do initially, but with practice and a lot of effort, you eventually you'll, you'll get pretty facile with it. Next, fluid and solid organs do conduct sound. So when you shoot ultrasound beams through these structures or through fluid, they'll come back and you'll be able to see them on, on your ultrasound screen. However, air and bone do not conduct sound. And as a result, you'll actually see shadowing with bone right here. This is a rib. You can see that there's a, a, a rim right here, but everything else is, is dark. So this is anechoic shadowing because the bone is too dense to, to conduct the sound waves. With air, as in this is lung right here, you actually have what's called dirty shadowing. So you have some anechoic areas, some hyperechoic areas, but there's that classic shimmering effect. Um, so you kind of see this kind of scattering all about. So this is, whenever you see this on your ultrasound images, this is air. Next, let's talk about scan techniques. So there are five basic ways you can manipulate the probe. The first is fanning right here. You're just kind of fanning left to right. And then we're actually angling or rocking the probe right now. Next, what we'll do is to rotate the probe along this axis, the perpendicular axis. And then last, you can actually move the probe or translate the probe or slide the probe as in this right here. And then the last, uh, which typically you don't do in, in echocardiography, is to actually put pressure or stab, and that can also give you a good image. The key is to be able to, to do this smoothly and slowly so that you're not missing out on key structures. And also, if you're having trouble, just try to do one movement at a time, either fanning or angling. And I find that when you have exhausted the fanning, angling, rotating, then that's when you actually you should slide the probe or try to move it into a different position. Let's now talk about the heart. So the heart is an is immensely complicated structure. You know, requires years and years of study to be a master of the heart. But uh, for the sake of a basic cardiac ultrasound, what I want you guys to do is I want you to think of the heart as a football. So a football has a long axis right here. It's where the treading is to put your fingers in for grip. And uh, the heart has the same thing. It's basically this line right here where you separate the right side from the left side of the heart. With that, if you actually were to cut that, you would get this, the left atrium right here. You get the left ventricle. The mitral valve is gonna be right here. Then you have your left ventricular outflow tract, the aortic valve the ascending aorta right here. And above, you actually have the right ventricle. Remember that the right ventricle is more or less a, a C-shaped structure, and it is the most anterior structure of your heart. And while we don't see this here, there's the pericardium that lines the heart as well. So next, let's actually look at the short axis of the heart. So if you actually had a short axis right here through the football, one of the things that you, you realize is that depending on which layer you're at, you may actually have different cross-sections. So if you, it, so this will be different from, from this right here, and then this will be different from this layer right here. The same thing is true with your personal short axis of the heart. At the level of the apex, you see something totally different from the level of the mitral valve, and you'll see structures that are different also at the level of the aortic valve. Next, let's bisect the football and along this axis right here, essentially a coronal view of the football. You would slice this and then you could you could peel about the football in this section right here. And if you did that with the heart, this is what you would see. You just kind of lift off the anterior part of the heart and you expose the ventricles. So this is uh, the right side of the heart, the left side right here. These are the atria, so you kind of just went through basic anatomy right here. You have your inferior vena cava, superior vena cava emptying into the right atrium. And you have your tricuspid valve, your right ventricle right here, 
flow goes through the pulmonic valve to the pulmonary arteries, comes back through the pulmonary veins right here, emptying into, into the left atrium, and you have your mitral valve here, your left ventricle, your left ventricular outflow tract, your aortic valve. This is your aortic outflow tract, and your ascending aorta curves around posteriorly uh, behind the heart to become your descending aorta right here. So let's actually go into the, the basic views of your heart. The first is your personal long view. If you put the probe down, usually about the third or fourth intercostal space, and you would point the indicator dot on the probe towards usually the left elbow right here. And this is the, the blue plane right here is the image that you would get if you did that. In order to get a good parasol long axis view, you need to see both the aortic valve and the mitral valve. Once you get those structures into view, you want to note that imaginary line or plane that connotes the heart's long axis. This is what you would see again. So you have your left atrium right here, your mitral valve, left ventricle, left ventricular outflow tract, aortic valve right here, and up on top you have your, your right ventricle right here. And all around right here, this is your pericardium. So this is gonna be your anterior pericardium and your posterior pericardium right here. And um, just we look at the parasol long axis to be able to, to assess for global systolic function, um, as well as to see if there's a pleural or pericardial effusion. So this is assessment of the systolic function. What you want to do is you want to look at that mitral valve right here, especially the anterior leaflet. You want to note the interventricular septum right here. This is the septal wall right here. And remember that in at the end of systole, the LV will be maximally contracted. And during early diastole, the mitral valve will open up. So with the opening of, of the mitral valve, the anterior uh, leaflet of that mitral valve will come really, really close to the septal wall. It sometimes will be seen as actually smacking the septal wall. And that's what you really want to see. So in someone with normal left ventricular function, you should have a pretty, the anterior leaflet come really, really close, if not actually slap that left ventricular septum. Now a normal distance between that septal wall and the anterior leaflet is roughly about six millimeters or less. But um, you don't necessarily have to measure it. You can usually just kind of tell. So this is a moderately depressed systolic function where you actually have that leaflet not very close, uh, maybe about a centimeter away. Now this is someone with severely depressed systolic function. And you can see that um, basically a leaflet comes nowhere near to the, the septal wall. And that there's actually very little movement of both walls right here, the septal wall and the posterior wall. Now, there's also a hyperdynamic left ventricular uh, systolic function, and that's when you're, usually your volume status is really, really poor. And you could see that here during end systole, as well as early diastole, there's really no blood in the left ventricle at all. So in these cases, you want to give lots of fluids. Next, with the parasol long axis view, you can tell there's a pleural versus pericardial effusion. And the first thing you want to do is you want to note that posterior pericardium. Remember that there's air all around here, so this is normal. This is just air shadowing right here. The other thing that you note is that this is the descending aorta right here. So this is completely normal. The descending aorta should be very close to the pericardium, to the heart structures right here. When you actually have fluid, you'll see an anechoic layer right here. So this is this is what pleural fluid looks like. If you see fluid right here, then you'll look you'll want to look at the descending aorta to see if there's actually a separation of the descending aorta from the, the actual heart. If there is no separation, then you know this is going to be more likely a pleural effusion. Now if you see separation right here, as in this thin stripe of fluid, from the descending aorta, this is a, a very small effusion. Um, when you have a, a very large effusion, you'll, you might not actually see the descending aorta at all because it'll be pushed posteriorly out of the ultrasound image. Uh, but if you see that there's a separation from the heart and the descending aorta, then you know this is going to be a pericardial effusion.
Next, we'll do a personal short axis. You start at the personal long axis. And again, you want to note that imaginary line that symbolizes the, the long axis of the heart. What you're going to do is, once you get a good personal long axis, you'll just rotate the probe clockwise 90 degrees, just like this. And this is your personal short axis. Remember that there are three different levels of a personal short axis. You have the level of the aortic valve, the mitral valve, and then the, near the apex of the heart. At the level of the aortic valve, you're no longer um, at the level of the ventricles. The ventricles are here, so you're actually at the level of the atria. So below, right here, is the left atrium. The right atrium is right here. This is the atrial septum right here. And this is the tricuspid valve. Remember that the RV is essentially a C-shaped structure right here. So this is the RV on top. And sometimes you can see the pulmonic valve right here. Uh, in the middle is your aortic valve, and your aortic valve should have three cusps. You should have your right coronary cusp, your left coronary cusp, and your non-coronary cusp. Sometimes people refer to that as the Mercedes-Benz sign because it looks like an upside-down version of the Mercedes-Benz sign. Next we have the level of the mitral valve, and here you can see the anterior mitral valve leaflet and the posterior mitral valve leaflet right here. Uh, the right ventricle is on the top left of the heart and um, sometimes we will call this the the fish mouth view and then we saw the level of the apex where you actually had the papillary muscles right here. So these are the pap muscles. So what do we um, typically use your personal short axis for? Well there's multiple uses, but one of the more common uses is to assess for right ventricular strain. So when you have right ventricular strain, that means that your pressure, especially in early diastole, is, exceeds your left ventricular pressure. And as a result, that common septal wall, the interventricular septum, starts to actually bow into the left ventricle. And you get what's called a D-shaped septum. In the acute setting, we typically worry about like a large pulmonary embolism causing acute pulmonary hypertension. And this is what you see right here. So in early diastole, the ventricle starts to relax, but this doesn't relax. It actually is pushed in because the pressure of the right ventricle exceeds the pressure of the left ventricle. So next, let's go to our apical views. You're going to put the probe just right below the, the left nipple and you're going to have your indicator dot to the patient's right and you're going to be aiming or angling towards uh, you're going to be pointing towards the, the right shoulder as well and this is usually what you get right here you have the left ventricle the right ventricle up on top remember that you're starting at the apex so you're at the top of the the, the screen closest to the the probe you're going to see the ventricles first then you'll see the atria themselves so you have your right atrium and left atrium, and you, you typically get a really good view of the tricuspid valve and the mitral valve also on your apical four-chamber view. Now, if you want it to um, play around a little bit more, you can actually rotate the, the probe clockwise, and you can actually get more of the right ventricle or less if you do it counterclockwise um, just by rotating the plane right here. And this is an example of that. So the right ventricle looks pretty small, but if you start to rotate, you can see that it starts to open up more and more just by simply rotating that plane right there. Next, if you wanted to image the aortic valve and the left ventricular outflow tract, all you need to do is actually to, to actually decrease the, your fanning angle. So um, just in relation to the patient's body, you just want to decrease that angle of, of of the probe from here to here so that you get the base of the heart and you can see that uh, you image the aortic outflow tract right here along with the LVOT. So this is your four chamber right here where you have just the, the four chambers of your heart and then your fifth chamber right here when you actually decrease the, the fanning angle you get your left ventricular outflow tract, your aortic valve and sometimes uh, your proximal aorta right here. And this is the view that you get Again, so the left atrium, left ventricle, and left ventricular outflow tract, aortic valve right here, and then proximal aorta right here.
So here's another way to get your uh, apical view. Start out with a personal short axis, slide the probe all the way until you get to near the apex. And then once you do that, you just kind of fan down and you should get a pretty good apical uh, four and five chamber view as well. Remember that you're pointing towards the right shoulder. Your indicator dot is uh, pointed to the patient's right still. And this is the, the, the plane that you get for your apical views. Um, and if you put the probe down in the peristernal, you kind of slide down to the apex and then you fan flat and you get your apical four chamber and five chamber views. You know, sometimes I'm asked, why do we actually look at the apical views? They're generally really hard to obtain. And a really good reason is that you actually are able to study the, the blood flow of the heart or the hemodynamics of the heart of using your apical windows. And you do this using a variant of Doppler called color Doppler. And how Doppler works in general, remember, is through the Doppler shift. So the frequency that is transmitted and the frequency that is reflected back from a moving object, that will tell the computer what the directionality of the object is as well as the magnitude of flow. Note, though, that if the flow is perpendicular to the ultrasound beam, you won't really see much of a Doppler shift. So that's why the apical views are really nice because the apex is at the top of the, the screen, it's right next to the transducer, and so flow usually is going to be more parallel to the ultrasound beam than in any of the other windows that we obtain. In color Doppler, the computer renders that as in blue and red, so blue flow is flow that's going away from the transducer, or in usually uh, flow that is going away from the top of the screen, and red flow is flow that's actually going towards the transducer or towards the top of the screen. The intensity of the color relates to the velocity itself. So in this example right here, you have this, the scale, 72 centimeters per second, and blue flow is going away from the top of the screen or where the transducer is, and red flow is going towards. And if you notice, the orange flow, the red flow is going into the LV during diastole and during the LV contraction you see blue flow going into the LVOT. That's blood that's being injected in systole. The last is your subcostal view and really this is the only uh, view that um, images the heart from the abdomen via the liver. So you need a good liver window. So you actually want to start about three or four centimeters lateral to the xiphoid process right here. You want to get a good liver window first. You want to be able to image that liver. Once you do that, you can angle their probe towards the left neck where the heart should be. And um, if you kind of fan a little bit, you'll get your sub xiphoid view. If you're still seeing a lot of bowel gas, you can actually move the probe up a little bit more this way. But you don't necessarily need to go right underneath the xiphoid process. This view is a, a component of the FAST exam as well, which we'll cover in the next lab. And when you get this view, you can see that this is liver right here. Remember, you're going through the liver. Your liver acts as a conduit of sound to go to your fluid-filled heart. And the closest structures are going to be on the right side because you're imaging the right side of the heart first. And farther away, you have the left side of the heart. So you have your right atrium, right ventricle, your septum right here, your left atrium, your mitral valve, and your left ventricle right here. So we typically look for pericardial fusions on this view. So this is a normal sub xiphoid view right here where you have right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle, and this is your left pericardium and this is your right pericardium. So there's no fluid surrounding the heart right here. Now take a look at this right here. You can see that this is the heart, but there's all this fluid all around the heart. So this is a large pericardial fusion on your subcostal or sub xiphoid view. I want to talk a little bit about convention. Um, so basically, when you're doing ultrasound, you should have the probe indicator pointed to the patient's right or the patient's head. And this, the dot on the screen right here should you typically be on the left side of the screen. This is done so that when you're facing the patient and you're facing your ultrasound machine, you're basically pointing in to the same side. Now, with, however, in traditional echocardiography, the screen dot is actually on the right, and 
As a result, in order to get the same orientation on the screen, most of the time the probe indicator is pointed to the patient's left. Now in general or emergency medicine usage, we keep that screen indicator on the left side of the screen so that the probe indicator still points to the patient's right and that will give you the same image as you get on a traditional echo. The sole exception is on the personal long axis where you actually point the indicator towards the left elbow but aside from that window the probe indicator is usually pointed to the patient's right. It's really confusing but just note that no matter what convention you're using you should still have the same image on the screen. With that, we're going to close. Remember that echocardiography requires a lot of patience and a lot of practice, so just keep on at it. It's always good to image in two planes. This will give you uh, much more information than if you actually had one cross-section. And with the four basic views, remember that with the parasol long, you, you want to note the mitral valve, the interventricular septum, your posterior pericardium, as well as your descending aorta. This will give you information on the systolic function as well as the presence of a pleural or pericardial effusion. With parasolic short axis views, you actually have three different levels. You have the aortic valve, the mitral valve, and the, the level of the papillary muscles. And with this view, you can assess for RV strain with that D-shaped septum. Now with your apical views, typically we're looking at the four chambers. But remember that if you actually decrease your fanning angle, you'll get your fifth chamber, the LVOT, and the outflow track. And also, we use Dopplers on the apical views to be able to look at the hemodynamics of the heart. Last, your subcostal or xiphoid view, you want to use that liver as your acoustic window, and it's a good view to assess for pericardial fusion. Thanks again for your attention to this video. If you have any questions or comments, just send me an email.